Hello and welcome to the All to Asset Allocation podcast. Today's interview is with Chris Hamm. Have you heard about Puerto Rico being the last true tax haven for Americans? I certainly have. In this episode, we dive deep into Puerto Rico. Where is it geographically? What is it? Why they came up with this and a bit of history around it. Then most importantly, what are the tax saving opportunities for mainland Americans? We talk about all things Puerto Rico, what it's like living there, the climate, hurricanes, they terrify me. What sort of people should be interested in looking at Puerto Rico and what to keep in mind if you're actually interested in doing it? What sort of gotchas exist that you should be aware of? Before you listen, please don't forget to like or subscribe to the podcast or even better, leave a review. If you're watching this on YouTube, give the video a little thumbs up and or subscribe to the channel. These things really help and they help spread the word about the podcast and really help keep this thing going. Okay, enjoy learning all about Puerto Rico and its potential tax advantages with Chris Ham. Enjoy. Chris, welcome to the All to Asset Allocation podcast. Excited to have you on today. Benny, thank you for having me. Calling in from good old Puerto Rico. Where in Puerto Rico? So we are in Dorado. We're about 30 minutes outside of San Juan. So pretty close, but a little bit uh, a little bit outside of downtown. Awesome. Yeah. As, so this episode is all about Puerto Rico. Uh, so before we jump into it, let's uh, start off a little bit about you, your background, and then we'll we'll dive into all things Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yeah, Ben. Um, I'm originally from Texas and I'm, uh, I'm living in Puerto Rico now. I've been down here for five years and um, I never thought that I would leave Texas in my wildest dreams. And when I moved down here before, I mean, it sounds ignorant, but I never even knew where Puerto Rico was. And now it's my forever home. But um, like I said, originally from Dallas, uh, I have a background in accounting. Um, I have an MBA and a, and a CPA, so well-versed in the tax side of things. And I was doing international self-insurance before I found out about Puerto Rico. And when I first heard about what Puerto Rico had to offer, I said, this is way too good to be true. So I came down here and checked it out. And I actually read a book called The World is Flat, um, which is a classic. And also The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. So both of those have been very influential in my life. And some of those aspects, you know, intermingle with what's going on in Puerto Rico. Um, Can you live in a low tax environment? Um, Can you communicate with people um, very easily, which I feel like COVID really helped that out. Um, And I don't like the cold because I was coming from Chicago. So um, I'll tell you, I don't think it's ever snowed in Puerto Rico in in its history. Um, so I like the warm weather. I love the beach and I love being an American, but I also love not paying taxes. So, um, I look to provide that opportunity for, you know, hundreds of entrepreneurs that really thousands that have relocated down here. Four hour work week was very, very influential in my life as well, as well as like flag theory, which I've done another Mm -hmm. podcast on. And just this idea of diversifying everything across multiple jurisdictions and currencies and all the things. Um, So before we get into why this is such an interesting opportunity and that people should be looking into, let's just start off for the listeners, uh, because there might be some people that don't even know where Puerto Rico is or Mm -hmm. what the relationship is of Puerto Rico with the U.S., because I've talked to people and they're like, oh, no, I can't leave the U.S. And you're like, it's kind of this other thing. So I think that's a great place to start. And when I first came down here, I thought Puerto Rico was like 45 minutes away from Miami, right by the Bahamas. And then you get on the flight from Miami and you're like, wait, it's two and a half hours away. Like, where am I going? Um, we're actually closer to Venezuela than we are to the mainland U.S. So if you look on the map in Puerto Rico, we are way out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it's actually a very big island. We have about three million people. So um, we're actually bigger than 20 states. Um, regarding your question about what is the relationship between you at the U.S. and Puerto Rico, um, it's actually a very interesting one. And um, it's been going on for quite a while. So um, Puerto Rico was uh, became a U.S. territory, an unincorporated territory, which is kind of important. Um, I'm not a political expert, but 
we got it from Spain in the, in the Spanish American war in 1898. Um, and historically Puerto Rico has really been like a military outpost for the U S um, until recently. And so we have all the um, rights and privileges of being U S citizens. Everyone that's born here is a U.S. citizen. Um, we transact in dollars. All of our banking is, you know, FINRA, FinCEN, FDIC insured. We're SEC regulated. We have the um, U.S. court system here. But the unique thing about Puerto Rico is no taxation without representation. So, Ben, you might remember the Boston Tea Party from 1700s, right? Everyone was pretty upset that they were getting taxed by the British and they weren't allowed to vote. Um, so the U.S. is stuck with that. Um, so Puerto Rico is domestic for everything besides our tax system. So um, there's some opportunities there and there are also some challenges there, too, that we work with every every single day. So um, it took me a while to understand, like, you know, how does all of this work? You know, what's in it for Puerto Rico? Um, frankly, we don't really have that much to offer the United States anymore because we're not in the wars like we used to be, uh, but they can't just get rid of us either. So, um, and there, that's a, that could be a whole podcast within itself. Okay. So um, that's really my, my two cents on that. But I do believe like right now, this is, this is going to be the Renaissance of Puerto Rico. There's been ups and downs from going back to the 1920s and thirties from, you know, the sugar cane industry. Um and a whole lot of other stuff. So that is, uh, that's a little elevator pitch on, on Puerto Rico right there for you. Nice. Nice. Okay. So, uh, I do eventually kind of want to get into touching on living in Puerto Rico, what it's like hurricanes sure. that scare the crap out of me. But, uh, first let's talk <laughs> about why, all the, why the hell we're talking about yeah. this little Island that's closer to Venezuela than to Miami. Mm -hmm. Uh, so just explain to me why this oh. should be such on people's in, uh, radar, Act 60, 2022, yep. whatever the way to explain it in the most succinct way. Yeah, so let me take a little bit of a step back on why do we have these amazing tax incentives in the first place? Um, so Puerto Rico has been um, really having a hard time economically since 2007. Um, not only the housing crisis and everything the U.S. experienced, but we also had... Um, you know, our government really hasn't been doing a good job of paying its debt. And that's really the short and sweet of that. Um, additionally, we've been having a big brain drain of like the middle class college educated um, Puerto Ricans who, if you're an attorney in Puerto Rico, you make $40,000 a year. Well, I can just take a plane to Orlando and make $80,000 easily. What's the, what's the best for me and my family? And they're doing, you know, what's in their best interest. Um, so in 2012, we, we filed bankruptcy, and um, since we're an unincorporated territory, it's very complicated. So we said, okay, we have to do something as an economy to get to get this thing jump started, right? We needed a little tinder on the fire. So we said, <clears throat> and to back up a little bit, Puerto Rico has kind of been notorious for tax incentives for decades. Um, the big pharmaceutical industries um, really started down here and were uh, benefiting from from the tax structure uh, that's kind of changed over time but back in the day i mean everyone in puerto rico was lying, lying with cash um, so we're kind of doing something similar for the middle market um, we're doing something for uh, middle market businesses who are providing export services um, our economy is about 50 percent of our gdp is manufacturing so that's unsustainable in this global economy and Everyone pretty much agrees on that. So we need to transform to a 21st century service-based economy. So how do we do that? Um, by tax incentives. The same thing Chicago is doing with like McDonald's, same thing Dallas is doing with like, you know, they have their Toyota headquarters. And, and you can see this throughout the country, but we're kind of doing this on a smaller, wider scale for businesses. Um, and then also we need rich people to move here pretty much because Rich people made their money one way or another. They're smart um, overall. And if we can incentivize them to invest capital into our economy, I mean, we're maxed out on our credit cards. We don't have any other option pretty much. So um, 
if you set up an export service business down here, which I work a lot with um, like tech companies, um, a lot of a lot of different verticals in the digital asset space, um, hedge funds, things like that, telemedicine, um, you pay a 4% um, tax and we're exempt from federal. So that's pretty powerful. Um, on the individual side, if you relocate here and you become a resident, which we can kind of get into that a little bit, uh, bit you pay 0% tax on all capital gains earned as a resident. So both short-term and long-term. So this has really become a haven for, yeah, crypto guys for sure. Um, and like just investors, right? And, and I mean, my portfolio is so wide, like all different types of industries, it's kind of crazy. So, um, but it's working and we're seeing this economic impact um, coming fast. And it's, I, I believe it's a really good thing for this island. Both of these acts have been consolidated into Act 60, right? But there's yes. basically two pieces. So one is you set up a Puerto Rican entity that is a service industry exporting services around the world. That is corporate income tax of 4% as opposed to whatever it is in all these other countries. Um, so the way that that would work is I'm uh, consulting or providing IT services or whatever for these foreign companies. They bill my Puerto Rican entity and I, I keep 96% of that income at the end of the day, right? Yep, yep. Awesome. So that used to be called Act 20, right? Act 20, yes. So so now it's all a part of one big Act 60. So Well, so... Puerto Rico's doing a good job. Um, I don't even know what it's called anymore because Puerto Rico has hundreds of different tax incentives. So um, at the beginning of 2020, I say, hey, we're going to take some out that aren't really working. And we need to streamline this because we want to step our game up too. So we're going to recodify all the incentives and call them Act 60, which it's kind of funny. If you park in a wrong parking spot in Puerto Rico, it says lay 60, you know, don't park here too. So I don't know how this legal thing works, but yes. Yeah, so we have Act 20, which is for businesses, Act 22 is for individuals. And this all started in 2012. So we do have a lot of good precedent because um, some people say it's too good to be true. And then, well, hey, I've been down here for you know 10 years. Okay, so Act 20, I think, um, makes a lot of sense. But the real key is Act 22. And I think this is what's probably is. A, a more interesting for like, the investor type person. And this means that you buy assets as a Puerto Rican resident, they appreciate in value, and then you owe zero capital income tax on it, right? Federally. That's correct. Um, I don't know if you want to get into the technicalities of like holding periods and things like that, but I would just say the, and, you know, number one, like do your own research. This isn't tax advice. You know, you, you hear it all over the place, right? But um, if you do earn a capital gain in the U.S. and then you move here and you earn some capital gains in Puerto Rico, you still do have to pay the IRS um, for the gain that you earn in their backyard unless you stay here for 10 years. So I do have some people that are uh, kind of playing the long game there. But yes, you're exactly right, Ben. If you establish residency in Puerto Rico and you buy something and it goes up, you're paying 0% tax unless it's U.S. real estate, and then that's, um, gotcha. you know, U.S. tax. So, and, and then further to that act previously referred mm -hmm. to as Act 22, um, yep. you also are exempt from federal income tax on income that, 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 that's non-Puerto Rican derived or is Puerto Rican derived, right? That's, that's correct. Um, so that's called section 936 in the tax code. All, all income earned in Puerto Rico is not subject to U.S. taxes. So if you want to own a you know, food truck in Puerto Rico, you're not paying the U.S., you're paying the Puerto Rican IRS, which we call La Hacienda. Um, so no, no income earned in Puerto Rico is taxed federally. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so U.S. real estate is the one asset class that's excluded, um, even if you do. So, I, I mean, for people that have massively appreciated um, assets that move down there, your options would be to sell and revalue at this, have this new cost basis. And then the, and the right. additional appreciation would be taxed. But the other option is just to wait it out for 10 years and then you don't owe any capital gains. Yeah, so that's called the built-in gain. Um, 
technically. Um, and if you have this built-in gain, so let's say, you know, you, you know, you bought Amazon 10, 10 years ago, right? It ran up a ton. You're like, I want to sell it. Well, you have to wait 10 more years as a Puerto Rican resident. And then that built-in gain, that primary portion will be taxed to Puerto Rico at 5%. So um, we have some illustration. I mean, you're looking at an incredibly low effective tax rate, right? Um, but some people that I have that are like in, uh, you know, venture capital or private equity, they, they have some exits that are coming up. And I say, look, just because it's, you're about to have a big exit doesn't mean you can't escape the, the tax man. Cause you know, the, the IRS is the biggest, baddest tax authority in the world. Um, but what you can do is, you know, if you get a valuation just say, Hey, um, it's worth this much right now sell it to yourself and move to Puerto Rico, you, you have to pay the tax on what it's worth now. Um, there's no way around that. You might be able to structure an installment sale or something to ease some cash flow um, for you. But um, we've done that a lot and that's been pretty successful too. Fascinating. So the idea is I make a VC investment at a valuation of $5 million. It's at mm-hmm. The, the latest round, latest valuation is 20 million. So I have a gain of whatever I've uh, invested by yeah. 4X, but I right. suspect it's going to IPO at 100 million. So I could shelter that right. 20 to 100 um, because it would be as a Puerto Rican president, right? Yeah, but I have some founders that say like, man, I am you know so rich on paper, but I, I can't stroke a you know, $5 million tax check either, right? So I'm just going to have to write it out. Uh, so... The cash flow considerations can be a challenge in, in something like that, especially with like, you know, um, first time founders that are about to hit it big too. So maybe they just say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm just going to get as many days as I can in Puerto Rico. And then on assets that aren't, um, marketable security. So like, you know, P or VC, um, you look at the days held between each jurisdiction and do a weighted average. So. It's getting a little bit into the weeds, but I think, you know, for your audience, it's, it's important to um, delineate that because you can go online and be like, holy cow, I can move to Puerto Rico and pay 0% tax. It's like, yes, but there is some fine print in there. And I think that's one of the goals of this discussion that we're having too, Ben, is to say, okay, what are the do's and don'ts down here? What is it really like? A hundred percent. And that's, that's the first reaction. Whenever I talk about this with Puerto Rico, people are like, mm-hmm. There's something that now you're not, you don't know the whole story. There's got to be a way that's, it's too good to be true. So what are the other qualifications um, to, to qualify for act 60? I mean, I go down there, I move, I have to buy property. I do the donations. Like what are all the um, check boxes? So we have a couple different um, regulatory bodies that we have to uh, appease pretty much. So, um, I would say the number number one, which Puerto Rico might disagree with me on this, but we have to follow the IRS residency rules. So what does it mean to be a resident of any place? Puerto Rico follows the same rules as, you know, if you want to move from California to Nevada or New York to Florida. Um, number one is um, the physical presence test. So there are a couple different ways to meet that physical presence test. Um, I'll tell you two. Um, the first one is you have to spend the majority of your time in Puerto Rico. So that's 183 days um, minimum. I like, well, overall, my philosophy is you need to make Puerto Rico your your home, right? So that's number one. So 183 days, or let's say you're an international traveler, which more and more people are just, you know, Airbnb in their way through life, pretty much. Um, if you spend less than 90 days in the mainland US, you spend more time in Puerto Rico than anywhere else, you can satisfy your physical presence test in that manner. So number one, you got to pretty much be here more than anywhere else. Um, number two, you have to have a tax home. So if your primary place of residence. Um, and then number three, there's actually a very interesting test and there's a lot of case law on this and it's kind of a great area. It's called the closer connection test. So that looks at all of the qualitative factors of your life to see where you live. Okay, you have a five million dollar house in La Jolla, and you're renting out a fifteen hundred dollar apartment in San Juan, and you know you have a California driver's license. Uh, uh, the California Franchise Tax Board is going to say no, right? Um, and they're probably right. Um, so, 
where are you doing your banking activities? Where is your family? Where are your assets located? Where are all of your valuables, right? Um, where's your dog? You know, all of these things, right? Um, the dog necessarily isn't in the sheet that we have to send to the IRS, but um, there's been case law on where's the dog, right? Oh, yeah. So, well, people uh, with their really kids crazy. in private school there and they're saying they live there, it's like, okay, obviously you're not, man. It gets complicated, right? So if you're in a complicated situation, then you probably need to talk to an attorney to understand um, what the rules are, right? Because that's getting pretty deep into the weeds. So um, I would say, yeah, you need to make Puerto Rico your home. You're allowed to come to the U.S. You're allowed to go visit your family. You're allowed to have a second house, things like that. But yeah, Puerto Rico is is your home. So that's the IRS stuff. Um, From a Puerto Rican standpoint, for Act 60, uh, well, for Act 20, I, I, I still call them Act 20 and 22 because Act 60, we could be talking about literally 100 different things. So um, for the export service business, um, you have to have at least one employee. That has changed from anywhere between zero to five over the past 10 years um, and could change again. Um, once you do sign a contract with the Puerto Rican government, you are locked into your terms. So um, right now it's one employee um, and you have to file an annual report like a census or something like that, which there are nominal fees associated with that. Um, if you're over a certain threshold, you do have to get a, a CPA, a Puerto Rican CPA to audit your books and submit that to the government. Um, from an individual investor side, which I think this is kind of more of our um, demographic here, You have to donate $10,000 a year to charity, which I think is reasonable. Um, If you're moving to Puerto Rico and paying no taxes, you still have a duty to society to contribute, right? But now it's your responsibility, not um, someone else who's making decisions behind a closed door allocating your funds. Um, So at least donate 10 grand to charity, um, and then you have to purchase a primary residence within two years of living down here. So, you know, our real estate market's been depressed. So we, if you want to come here and take advantage, we need you to buy a house to, you know, get this thing going. Um, In some areas, the real estate has gone insane, right? So like in my neighborhood, it's, it's three X in three years, right? And that's a pretty damn good investment. And, you know, real estate is pretty slow. So it's, it's crazy times down here for sure. The word is out. This obviously all sounds great. You talk to a ton of people about going Mm -hmm. down there. What are the most common, I mean, common misunderstandings up front is a lot of things, but like once I decide to go and do it and take advantage of this opportunity, what are, what is the, like the thing that comes up most often that they're like, oh shit, I wish I would have known that up front. So the big thing for me, and I work with a lot of, you know, high impact entrepreneurs is island time. And we might laugh to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, 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 I tried to fight it for years, Ben. Okay. Like, Hey, we need to show up at nine o'clock. We need to have a meeting. It needs to be fast. Right. It's not how it works down here. Um, if someone doesn't have an update for you, they're just not going to email you or even call you back or talk to you. So, um, it's just, it's, it's our culture down here, right? We're very tranquilo, you know, um, work ends at about one o'clock on Friday, right? Um, and lunches are three hours long. That's just how it goes. So um, also funny story, Christmas starts after Thanksgiving and it ends on like January 18th after Three Kings Day. So um, just nothing's happening. Right. And it just so happens to be that's like the most critical time of the year to move down. So um, a big thing that I try to do, especially with you New Yorkers who are listening, you got to relax because um, you'll drive yourself crazy trying to fight this island time. Um, It's maybe some of the reason why we're in the situation that we're in, but it it is what it is. Um, But so that's the first thing that really popped into my mind is island time. And I've learned to adapt and I've, you know, probably a victim of it too. Right. Um, the big three things though, that I see when moving down are safety, um, medical care and, and schools. And I'm confident to say that Puerto Rico checks all the boxes on all three of those, um, from a safety standpoint. Yeah, there are bad areas in Puerto Rico, but I also, you know, came from Chicago, right. And I love Chicago, um, which Chicago has its, its bad areas as well. 
Um, through medical side of things, I would say, yeah, the level of care is not um, what you could expect in the U.S., but, you know, we have things like concierge doctors, like my doctor went to Harvard. Um, we're also opening uh, John Hopkins in Dorado at supposed to be Q4, and I drove by it today, and it, it looks ready to go. So that's supposed to be the number one research facility in the Caribbean. So we're very excited about that. So healthcare is definitely getting better down here. And then um, schooling. Um, if you're going to bring your kids down here, they're definitely going to go to private school. You know, they cost about 20 grand a year. They're all English speaking. Um, the SAT, ACT scores are high and the college acceptances are pretty, um, pretty exceptional too. So I was kind of surprised by that, frankly, when I first moved out. So, um, those are really the, the big things that I see when, when people are looking to evaluate a relocation down here. Yeah. Well, those are pleasant surprises as well. Um, Touching on the crime a bit, and I know every city has its rough <clears throat> spots, but yeah. I, I just think like bigger picture. So you have a bunch of rich Americans moving down there to like save on taxes and it's mm -hmm. a relatively impoverished uh, place. So yes. is it worried about like, I mean, do all the the Act 60 people from mainland all live in like these guarded compounds and drive armored cars and like the rest of the people are, are there's like a growing distrust for these sorts of people and uh, like the worried about the widening wealth gap there. So Puerto Rico has always had a super big wealth gap, right? Um, through a variety of different reasons, but um a lot of communities in Puerto Rico are gated as just, you know, and the, we're not worried about like getting kidnapped or anything like that. But, you know, if you go to old San Juan and like leave your laptop in the front of your car and leave it there, you know, someone could break in and get it. But that's just like it is everywhere else. Right. So um, I haven't dealt with any crime personally, and I don't know anyone firsthand that's, you know, had their house broken into or like, and well, number one, like where we live my door is unlocked 24 seven, right? It's very, very safe um, where we live. But I also lived in San Juan right on the street and we had a gate and that was super fun too. And, you know, my wife would go walk the dog at night in the city too. So, um, no, it's, it's an Island culture, Ben. So, you know, they're just really just want to hang out by the beach and drink beer. You know, um, maybe that's a generalization, but it yeah, could be worse. Um, yeah, it could be worse, but, so, no, we don't really see, you know, crazy stuff going on or, you know, uh, tourists getting attacked or something like that. Yes, things happen here and there, but there's also facts and circumstances that, um, you know, can paint maybe a more clear picture too. like, OK, what was an American tourist doing in the drug area? Right. Mm -hmm. Probably getting drugs and they I don't know. So I don't go down there. Um, but. Yeah, I overall, I think Puerto Rico is is very safe. Um, but if yeah, if we're talking about the wealth gap, too, right? So maybe one of your questions is, is there animosity towards Americans for moving down here? And uh, I would like to say mainland, there's not Americans because we all are Americans. Um, some people don't like it, to be to be frank. And I try to have conversations with them and okay, why don't you like it? Well, we're colonizers. Okay, well, what's your game plan for fixing Puerto Rico? Um, the conversation kind of stops there and it gets emotional, right? Um, so from my perspective, I mean, I, I am Puerto Rican now. I feel like I'm 100% Puerto Rican um, and I want to make this place a better place. And I don't know how else we can do it besides the private sector, because we tried the public sector for four years and it failed terribly. Um, for example, only two thirds of the people in Puerto Rico work and one third of those people work for the government. So I think that was um, designed uh, for, for a reason. And it's I mean, incredible inefficiencies from my, my perspective. So, um, are we going to be able to backtrack on that? No, but can we move forward and try to, we need to be a global competitor, right? And even, you know, 
the U.S. is looking at reshoring companies down to Puerto Rico, especially pharma and things like that, biotech. It's a great idea too, right? Let's bring them back on our soil. So um, the government has been pretty bad to Puerto Rico. The, the local government has been been a big detriment to, to the growth of the island for, for decades. And now they've kind of seen the light to say, hey, um, is this going to save Puerto Rico? No, it's not. But is it better than nothing? Absolutely. Um, because we can't get any more free money. Yeah. No, a lot think... of the Puerto Ricans know that, like the business entrepreneurs and, and the government officials, most of them know that. They see the data. They're like, wow. And you can see it firsthand, too. Just, you know, I've been here for five years. It's like, wow, things are getting better. And it's, nice. it's happy. It makes me happy. Nice. Uh, two more on, like, living, interacting in Puerto Rico mm-hmm. itself. Uh hurricane season and infrastructure issues Mm -hmm. so it's hurricane season right now and i play golf today so but i will say that we are always keeping an eye out for the hurricanes right um i will tell you my house is built out of concrete and every good house in puerto rico is built out of concrete i'm about maybe 400 yards from the ocean we didn't have any damage during hurricane maria which was like an F3 tornado with two feet of rain in a 24 hour period. So this was a once in a hundred year storm. It was so devastating. We are still very traumatized from Hurricane Maria. It was the worst thing I've ever seen, like by far. Um, But hurricane, we're in the Caribbean, right? Um, Hurricanes hit Florida, hurricanes hit Houston, hurricanes hit New Orleans. So um, I think after Maria, we had to learn a tough lesson, Um, but we're much more prepared now for these type of things and if you can afford a flight then you can get out right we have flights all the time too all over the place um but if you a lot of the poorer people in puerto rico they moved out to the mountains you know 100 years ago 50 years ago and they said hey this is my house um they don't have an address they you know it was their grandparents' house and it was their parents' house. Now it's their house and their kids live there. And then this was a lot on the news when they really didn't tell the story. FEMA says, hey, look, can we see your property deed? And then we'll fix your house. Well, we don't have a property. We just live here, right? And they're like, well, sorry, because FEMA is kind of like a military style thing. So they have, you know, senior operating procedures. So um, I think they got that worked out eventually, but um, kind of transitioning into infrastructure um, Puerto Rico had the own, the last state-owned utility company in the United States. That was recently just privatized to a company called Luma Energy. And there's been some bumps in the road, as you know, was expected. But you know, we have the highest electricity in the country right now. We're paying 28 cents a kilowatt hour. You know, Texas, they're paying seven cents. So that's really a regressive tax on people, too. Right. I can afford a thousand dollar electric bill like a lot of people can. Right. So we got to get in. It's also a big hindrance on businesses and tourism. Right. One of the reasons tourism is, uh, I mean, a third of what it is in other Caribbean countries is because we have to pay very high electricity and that's their highest line item, too. Right. So we're there's a big push on renewable energy, which we have sun all year round. I don't know why, like renewables is great. And especially in Puerto Rico, it makes the most economic sense because of our um, sun energy and because of the high prices. Um, other infrastructure, so like housing, we're getting you know ten billion dollars or some some crazy number for you know all new government housing, pretty much, right? Um, and we're also getting ten percent of our GDP for ten years to rebuild like random stuff too. Um, Puerto Rico just became like one of a new testing site for 5G, which some people think 5G is, you know, some conspiracy theory. I think 5G is great. Um, we need fast internet. Um, also, Google launched this. I don't know if you know what it's called, but like when they put the balloons up in the air and like we could have Wi Fi around. So the they're name, doing that here. Yeah. Yeah. So nice. that's pretty cool too. Um, so, um, Infrastructure is getting a lot better, but if you come down here, when I first came down here, I, I flew and I'm like, wow, there's like skyscrapers. There's like good highways. Like my phone has 5G LTE. Like 
I thought this was going to be like going to a Caribbean, like different country, right? Um, it has its own culture and Puerto Rico is its own thing. But if, if we didn't have all the amenities that, you know, we're used to as living in the mainland, we wouldn't be here, right? So um, when my wife saw there was Krispy Kreme in Costco here, she was like, okay, I'm in, right? <laughs> so, um, so little things like that. Um, um, we, we need that kind of stuff. Right. So, um, yeah, that's kind of my two cents on, on infrastructure and hurricanes. So it's September 29th. I don't know when you're releasing this, but when you release this, I fingers crossed we're out of hurricane season and we're clear. So we've been clear for a couple of years now. So that's good. So like November through March, April is kind of like the non-hurricane season right yeah so like mid-october through Ju- june pretty much oh, okay june or july okay. so yeah good to close. know good to know okay uh so that's super helpful kind of actually uh, boots on the ground getting some feedback on how it is actually mm-hmm. living there i'm i'm less concerned i've lived all over the place but for my uh <laughs> listeners for sure um right. i guess my next question would be like the risks of all of this changing. So you said that uh, when you when you sign, you kind of lock in the current one. And I, I think there's some changes coming in 2022 um, and we can go into that, but more of like, you go down there, you spend three years, you're loving it. And then like the the IRS or the US government is like, no, actually that that's stupid. We're gonna retroactively go after all of that. Is that a real risk? Well, there's a couple couple different issues that you touched on there, Ben. So number one, the IRS can, the big, the big thing is, well, really two factors that the IRS can challenge you on is, were you really a resident, right? Um, It's pretty easy to say yes or no on that. A lot of that is objective. The closer connection test, a little subjective, where's the dog, et cetera, et cetera. Um, But from a business side of things, um, were you earning income in the United States that you said was Puerto Rican income? Um, that's what the IRS is looking at as well. So that's not that's not clawing back to say, hey, your decree is not legit. It's you weren't doing proper accounting and due diligence and you're legal and all of that. So that's a whole other podcast as well. Um, what is an arms leak transaction um, between related parties on a cross border uh, deal? Um, but Going back to your question from from a Puerto Rican side, um, and I work a lot with the Puerto Rican government and the Department of Economic Development and Commerce down here. We always want to improve the program because we want what's best for Puerto Rico. So um, there has been a bill introduced in the House to say, hey, let's make capital gains 12 percent moving forward, which right now it's zero. Okay, which is amazing. Um, should it be 12%? I think that's a little high. I'm just, you know, speaking from my, my personal perspective, but, um, what's going to be happening in the States? Um, if I was a betting man, I would bet that, you know, those tax rates are going up. Um, and a lot of the people who live down here are like the hedge fund guys and the crypto guys, they're all their money's capital gains pretty much. So, um, do I think Puerto Rico should, um, try to refine their program to capture some of that revenue, yes, right? But we need to make it um, palatable and not a hindrance for people to move down. They go, okay, that's too high for me, I'll stay where I'm at. So I don't know what that number is, but we still need to have a pretty sexy, attractive deal to get people down here because the indirect economic effects of this of this tax incentive program are, have been so successful for Puerto Rico. So um, we're working with legislators and other stakeholders to see, you know, what is the best for Puerto Rico. Um, ben, the law came into into enactment in 2012. It's probably changed five or six times. I don't, I don't, I could figure out how many times it has, but. You know, every administration looks to modify something a little bit here and there. Um, so we'll see. I mean, there's only f- about five or six thousand businesses and individual investors in the program right now. So um, it's a lot smaller than a lot of people think. 
Um, we want 25, 30,000 down here. I want 300,000 down here. I need, I need Elon to move down here. Okay. So I'm working on him. Um, but if we're going to make this place to sing aboard the Caribbean, we got to think big. Um, and if Puerto Rico doesn't get in, in its own way, I think that can happen, but there's quite a lot of stakeholders on what happens in our economy. So, um, I don't yeah. agree with a lot of them, but, um, that's the reality. Totally get it. I, I think for like the 10 year, what's it called when you wait 10 years and then yeah, the the built in step games. up built yeah. in games. Yeah. I mean, the biggest worry would be that you go down there, right, with some appreciated assets, assuming that you're going to wait it out for 10 years, and then they change that law, and you've just spent nine years, like, waiting for well, this Well, that's thing. in your contract, too, right? So okay. it's all pretty clearly defined. You're locked in. So on the other side of it, some people moved down here for their export service business and said, you have to have five employees. Well, now it's one. And they want to say, hey, I only want one. They're like, sorry, like you're locked into this. So it goes both ways. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you have a contract with the government saying you're adhering to Act 60 that stipulates this, this, and this. So even mm -hmm. like in 2022, when it changes, I think it changes from four to 12% for Act 20. Nothing's right? been voted oh. on yet. Gotcha. And end of september i don't yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so we don't, we don't want to speculate on what's gonna happen okay so so, so let's uh, say it goes to 12 percent. Yeah. yeah then so then, then you yeah, would be you're under 12 percent. yeah i'm locked in at zero right gotcha so if you come down and it's 12 then you're you're in for 12 okay so um the other thing that I thought was surprising when looking was um, it's a it's a calendar year, right? So if I move down there in October of 2021, um, my like calendar start date doesn't start till January 2022, right? Yep, that's correct. So that's IRS federal uh, residency regulations. So that is the same everywhere. Yep. Gotcha. And then I'm curious. Um, so how long does this whole process uh, take? I mean, obviously from Thanksgiving till New Year's, everything is kind of slow, including uh, government agencies, I'm sure, are even slower. So like if somebody moves well, down- The government's somewhere. always slow. Well, yeah, the government's always say, slow. So even slower. I mean, my God. Um, is it actually feasible to hit that January 1 start date if you yeah, start it, in December? Yeah, it is. Um, I, the biggest thing that you need to do is find a place to live. Okay. So yes, we can get all your paperwork done. You know, you have to submit a background check. You have to submit your banking documents. You have to submit a business plan and, you know, a lot of different things. Right. Um, that doesn't, that, you know, that takes a couple of days to get all of that together. Right. Um, if we're looking at doing, you know, cross border, cross border tax transactions, that takes the accountants a couple months to figure that out, and you know, tens of thousands of dollars of legal, right? So, from a, if you're an individual investor and you say, hey, I want to move to Puerto Rico because I think Bitcoin and Ethereum are going to the moon next year, um, and you call me and you say, hey, Chris, I need a place tomorrow. Okay, bring your checkbook, and we'll find you a place tomorrow, and you know, we'll start doing all the things to get you set up. So it really doesn't take that long. Um, I think um, another important aspect of this is um, when does my decree become effective? So your decree is retroactive to your filing date. So then you have to get all these papers in and we have to submit it. And then you get a, a case number, which is basically like your EIN for the tax incentive office. You say, hey, um, here's my EIN number or my, my case number and I'm good to go, but I still have to wait like six or nine months for the government to actually sign it. Um, I think that's a big benefit of working with someone like me is I can tell you before we even sign it, if it's going to work or not. Right. So my batting average is a thousand on that, but if you have a business that's not going to work, we're not I'm not going to make you spend the money. I don't want to waste my time dealing with this either. Right. So um, qualification and, you know, preliminary feasibility analysis. Uh, we do a lot of that. So um, that just saves a lot of time, money, and, you know, frankly, pain on the front end. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, 
so uh, timeline, super quick. I, I like that they the decree is effective from your filing date. So even if they drag right. their feet, which they always do, it's a government agency. No different than anywhere mm-hmm. else in the world. No. Nope. Um, I'm actually, I'm doing my golden visa in Portugal and it's the same thing. It's okay. like, okay, we yep, filed, you'll thing. have your residency in a year and a half. And you're like, yep. what? <laughs> um, which is nuts. Uh, curious on, co- are, are you comfortable sharing like cost estimation, ballpark for people? It depends. It depends because um, if you're simple, you know, maybe you can get out of there with like 10 grand, right? If you're complicated, you know, I have some guys that own 30 businesses. So it's like, you're going to have to pay me 10 yeah, grand to like get all the limit. documents yeah. organized. Right. Um, so, you know, if you need a residency attorney, if you need a transfer pricing study done, um, you know, if you're a heavy hitter, you probably want to do some estate planning down here because that's different too. So I would say, you know, anywhere between 10 and a hundred grand. And that is a super wide range. I would say um, if I had to pick a number, that was my best guess. I would say call it 30 grand and, you'll be good. Generally okay. speaking. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and you know what? I never, we never talked, we talked about you and how you got involved with yeah. uh, Puerto Rico, but definitely pitch Casper and like what you guys are working on and what you do and the services that sure. you provide. Yeah. So we went to the Puerto Rican government and said, this is amazing. They're like, yeah, we know. I'm like, we need to get the word out. And they're like, yeah, we know. And I go, can you pay me to get the word out? And they go, well, Chris, we don't have any money. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> we have a designation called a qualified promoter designation with the Department of Economic Development and Commerce, um, where we are incentivized to streamline businesses and individuals moving down to Puerto Rico. Um, and we have a pretty unique compensation model. Um, we're kind of on a commission basis. So um if I bring a business down, I get a percentage of their taxes um, for 15 years. So I kind of look at myself as like a mini VC. Um, so I get 30 bips on net for 15 years for all the clients that I bring down. And what do I do? Um, number one, like I said, the feasibility analysis is big. Um, just to say, okay, how much is this going to cost? How much am I going to be saving relatively before I start writing checks to attorneys pretty much? So that's really step one. Um, step two is a scouting trip. So come down, you know, we'll have our guys pick you up from the airport, which you, you know, discount our rates at the, at the hotels. And before this, we're saying like, what is important to you? Um, I have to be on the beach. I love to surf. Okay. Well, or I need to be close to the airport or I really need to be close to a, to a school or I've had medical issues. I need to be close to a good doctor. So whatever you want to do, we can tailor um, your scouting trip around, your individual preferences. So you say, okay, Chris, great. Um, this looks good. Or Chris, you know what? This isn't for me. Either way, I'm, I'm happy that we, you know, uncover the solution, which, you know, is really what the scouting trip is about. So then we'll help you find a good attorney. So, you know, if you're in the digital asset space, you need a guy that's an expert in crypto. So, you know, we have that person, right? That's going to be a different person than, okay, I'm in the, you know, real estate development industry or my company is going to talk to the public, uh, so on and so forth, or, you know, I have VC deals or whatever. Um, And then we got to find you a house. So um, we work with a handful of realtors in Puerto Rico. There's been, there's no MLS system in Puerto Rico. So, um, that's not great for finding a place. Um, if you find a place, people don't answer the phone. They don't email you back. They say it's you know this much, and then you sign the contract, and it just doesn't right. So um, our, our job is to not make that happen, right? So okay, you get a house, you're all set up, you got the good attorney, um, you need an ongoing accountant, um, you're going to need to get a Puerto Rican driver's license, which um, I would be willing to bet that if you Ben went to the driver's license place, you would be there for 16 hours over two days trying to get this thing. Um, You have to get the bills in your name, like get your electricity in your name. That's damn near impossible too, right? So um, some of these are tax compliance issues that we have to um, satisfy to become residents, but also some of them are like, Chris, like this is a big pain in my ass. Like, how do I, how do I fix this? Don't worry about it. I know the people that have done it. Um, and we've really been 
crafting our offering for the past five years. And I'll tell you in the beginning, it was a little rocky, right? So some of my early guys had to go through some trial and error, which, you know, they love me and I love them, but a little bit, a little bit rocky. That's, that's Puerto Rico, right? That's just how it goes. Um, so, and then kind of the next step is let's get involved in the community, right? Whether that's, you know, hiring people or going to job fairs at colleges or donating to charities or being on the board of charities down here, right? I'm on the board of a couple charities down here. Um, I'm from Texas. I never really cared about the environment until I came to Puerto Rico. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, we have, we have a serious issue I'm down here, right? And, and now globally, right? So, um, I'm on the board of a charity that, you know, we're, we're looking to recycle down here. We don't have enough recycling centers down here. Right. Um, that's been hugely successful. Um, so, but let's also go to the Puerto Rican Mardi Gras, right. And old San Juan with like all of us, right. It's so much fun. You're out till, you know, sunrise. Um, and just, just having fun and experiencing this unique culture, which is, you know, my favorite culture in the world too. Right. Um, so you know, connecting all these like-minded entrepreneurs is really an unsung benefit of moving down here too. And you'd be surprised how many business deals get done watching some football or, or golfing or just, you know, going out there surfing too. Right. So um, that that's pretty cool too. So yeah, we, we set all that stuff up too. So I really look at ourselves as, you know, full service relocation specialist in a, in a unique place. Who should be and, and, and not like culturally, oh, I'm excited to, exp uh, to explore a new culture yeah. and uh, experience, but like business-wise, uh, investment-wise, who should be most interested in Puerto Rico? And who who is this like less, uh, less super advantageous for? Yeah. So I would really look at it from a personal perspective first. So like, number one, where do you live? Um, a lot of my clients are from California, Illinois, New York, and New Jersey. I have a handful of people that moved from New York to Florida and they said, wow, why don't we just come down to Puerto Rico? So, you know, you're tax conscious, number one, there's no way around that. Um, if you don't like warm weather, this ain't the place for you. I'll tell you that. I have buddies that are like, it's too hot for me down here. I mean, I'm from Texas, so it's not really that hot for me, but it, it is. We're closer to the equator. Um, um, any business that's remote, which is crazy to say because now pretty much everyone is remote before I would have guys, guys and gals call me and say, Chris, I'd love to move down there. The numbers make sense, but I just have to be with my team. I think COVID happened. And then they're like, Holy shit, New York sucks. You know, uh, we, I, I'm, I'm moving out of New York somewhere. So I might as well come, come check it out. Um, and it takes about the same time to drive to the Hamptons in traffic as it does to get to Puerto Rico. So that's, that's kind of funny. Um, but um, tech is big. Like I said, crypto is big. Um, all financial services, all professional services, really. Um, we have a pretty nice niche of radiologists too, but um, it's really all across the board. If you can have, you know, an independent party or in, you know, in a lot of cases, a related party, pay you uh, a, an arm's length transaction to a, a business that that'll work. But, you know, I have guys that like work at Facebook that are like, Hey, I want to move to Puerto Rico. Well, Facebook's not going to let you start, you know, you know, bin Puerto Rico and pay you right. Cause all of their HR and all of that. But so I have some people that are still working for a company in the Bay and, but they're just down here waiting for their, you know, investing their options and then they're going to sell them because they're a resident of Puerto Rico, but they're still paying taxes on, on their W2. So if you're W2, um, you're not going to get any tax benefit from your, your income, your actively earned income. Um, if you are a real estate person, there's not really much benefit unless you are a big dog. Um, I would say doctors because you have to be in the OR to make your money. But if you own a lot of doctor's offices, then yeah, you can manage them all from here. So it is pretty flexible on that end. Um, I do find that, you know, people who have been recently divorced are looking to get, they lost half their money. So they're looking to get their money back. Um, 
empty nesters too are um, pretty popular with me. And then also, you know, like single, like digital nomads too, right? There's that's, that's a lot of us, right? If you have a laptop and internet connection, you can live from anywhere. Why don't you start accumulating your wealth in a, in a low tax environment? Um, so those are the ones that come to my mind off the top of my head. That's super helpful. And then I wanted to just comment on the W2 employees. So the way around that, the, what that I think about would be you set up a Puerto Rican export services company yep. and then have a B2B relationship where the, the company contracts you through that Puerto Rican entity. Uh, and then you would get around, you would have these tax benefits, yep. right? Yeah. Yep. That's correct. And also that's going to save your previous employer, now your client, um, some money on like social security and unemployment taxes too, because now you're in charge of that as a 1099. So there is gotcha. some cost savings there, but you have to have flexibility with your employer, previous employer slash current client. So sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Like my guys from Morgan Stanley, they're not with that. Yeah, no, that that totally makes sense. But sometimes these uh, employees, you know, they quit or they retire and then they come back on as a consultant from time to time anyways. And it's like, oh, you just spin up an entity right. and build from that and have yep. this entity uh, consultant sort of uh, relationship. Uh, Chris, this was incredibly helpful. I think we covered a ton. I've got some great notes. Uh, I'll, I'll drop a lot of these links and things we've talked about into the show notes. Um, but anything else you want to leave the listeners with? Where can they find out more no, about you, about you know, Casper? You know, I really love your your podcast too. And you have such a wide variety of guests too. I feel like smarter every time I listen to one of your podcasts. So I hope I can contribute back to um, your ecosystem. Um, but if, you know, going back to your question, if you want to learn more about um, Puerto Rico, our website is www.joincasper. That is C-A-S-P-R.com. No E um, in there. We're also on Instagram at joincasper. So not much tax advice on our Instagram page, but a lot of sweet pictures about Puerto Rico and the lifestyle, which is, you know, I'll tell you, Ben, I moved here for the taxes. I'm staying for the lifestyle and the culture. And, and that might sound cliche, but it is 100% true. And so many of my people say like, wow, if the tax incentives went away, like I would rather live here too. So I know it's hard to understand because a lot of people are in their own world, but um, I just feel so blessed to live here. And sometimes I need to pinch myself and remind myself that I'm not on vacation because it is a paradise down here. But um. Yeah, I mean, as you can tell, I, I love Puerto Rico. I'm super bullish on our future. And I think it's a great place for um, entrepreneurs and investors to, to build wealth and to also to contribute to uh, an economy and make a big difference. Awesome. What a great way to end it. Chris, been a real pleasure. Really appreciate you taking the time and jumping on here today, tonight. Absolutely. Yep. Take care, my man. We'll see ya. There you go. First off, thank you very much for listening all the way through. I hope you got a lot of value out of that conversation. As always, you can find show notes, links, and more at altassetallocation.com. Please share this with anyone you think might be interested and derive any value from this conversation. And as always, you can reach out to me for any feedback or questions. Please give the video a like, or even better, subscribe on YouTube or your podcast player of choice. This really helps others find the podcast or the video as well. Thanks a lot. Hope everybody has a fantastic day and stay safe out there and invest wisely. Cheers.